China and West Nile fever virus. As a result of the first Gulf War, hundreds of thousands of our military are now sick and many have died. The official figure of those who served in Operation Desert Shield and Storm is 697,000. The Department of Defense has now declared nearly 250,000 of those troops as permanently disabled. The official position of the Department of Defense is that there are no classified or unclassified documents that exist to prove that chemicals and biologicals were used in the first Gulf War. But in only a 100-hour war, when less than 150 troops died, how do we explain the morbidity and mortality rate of nearly 450,000 of our servicemen and women? At the time that the Gulf War started, I was the uh, nuclear medical sciences officer, uh, intelligence and cover and everything, special operations officer, mobilization officer, training officer for 330th Medical Brigade. That's the largest medical brigade in the U.S. Army. Uh, it's an Army Reserve Medical Command uh, under a one-star general. Dr. Doug Rocky is a U.S. Army health physicist and nuclear medical sciences officer. Dr. Rocky has expertise in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare operations, microwave radiation, emergency response, decontamination, and battlefield cleanup. We were the super garbage men. We had to clean up the messes. We had to identify the messes. We had to collect all the garbage. We had to provide the on-site medical care. It's a lot. All the Iraqi equipment, a lot of U.S. equipment, contains radiological components. When those, that equipment was blowing up, the radiological materials were released into the environment, exposing and contaminating. And then to top it all off, we used uranium munitions, known as depleted uranium. They've been used back in 1973 by the Israelis against the uh, Egyptians. But during Gulf War I, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, we took it to a totally new level the use of radioactive materials on the battlefield. Deliberately taken tons and tons, actually over 350 tons of solid radioactive materials and dispersed it across Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. Taking our radioactive waste and throw it in somebody else's backyard. I am considered a disabled veteran. I've got a 40% disability from the United States Department of Veteran Affairs for combat injuries caused by depleted uranium and other exposures. Lieutenant Colonel John Marks is an A-10 pilot attached to the 303rd Fighter Squadron stationed at Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri. The reason that they use depleted uranium is it's a very dense, heavy metal and it's uh, able to penetrate uh, the most armor of any type of material used. Uh, it is a very minor amount of radioactivity, but it's not anything that, if as long as it's in its bullet form, it can be stored and it's not any type of hazardous material. Once it hits a, a vehicle and vaporizes, then it becomes uh, more of a, of a hazardous uh, material that uh, you have to have special handling of that type of thing. But in its normal bullet form, it's not uh, hazardous and, uh, because of the depleted uranium. It is highly effective against armor. We got direct memorandum from the Department of the Army and other Department of Defense officials specifically telling us that not only were uranium munitions a health threat, they were a serious health threat, the contamination. We got direct warnings, fame Los Alamos memorandum, that uh, to make sure and write a report so that uranium munitions can always be used because there's direct concern about the health and environmental effects. We had the warnings. We also have the responsibility to put together all the decontamination guidelines and also what's called the Combat Lifesaver Program. So myself and my team wrote that, which has now been adopted by the Army and is used every day by the Army. Battlefields and fighting are by nature hazardous to your health. Some hazards are easy to identify and well understood. Soldiers recognize the serious hazards presented by incoming artillery shells and bullets and take appropriate actions. However, some lesser hazards from new technological applications are not so well known and recognized. One of these newer applications 
is the use of depleted uranium in munitions and equipment armor. Depleted uranium is obtained from uranium ore, which is found throughout the world. In the United States, this ore is mined in New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and Arizona. Uranium ore contains three isotopes. By weight, 99.28%, which is uranium-238. 0.71%, which is uranium-235. And 0.0058%, which is uranium-234. Of these three isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-234 are used for nuclear fuel and weapons. Uranium-238 becomes depleted uranium. This is an aluminum model of one DU tank route. This route would be fired by an Abrams tank. If it was actually uranium rather than aluminum, it would be over 10 pounds of solid uranium. What happens, it moves extremely high velocity. The minute it leaves the bore of the gun, it catches fire. So this rod is a burning rod of uranium. It impacts tremendous forces, unbelievable forces, over this very small diameter. And it's like a blowtorch with tremendous forces that punches right through. Now as this breaks through and goes into anything, it can be steel, concrete, sandbag bunkers, wood, or anything, uranium itself is soft. So you have a, parts of the fragments of uranium breaks off as it enters and goes through. The uranium rod emits alpha, beta, and gamma radiation and x-ray radiation. The alpha particle is a 4.15 MeV particle. That's 4.15 million electron volts. Now the intercellular voltage, this, the voltage that your cell operates biologically, is 10 electron volts. So when that cell is bombarded by an alpha particle at 4.5 million electron volts, it doesn't have a good day. We have all kinds of other problems. We have the beta particle and the gamma rays, the x-rays. Now we've actually measured the ionizing radiation emissions from a DU rod within say four to six inches at over 300 millirems per hour. Now that radiation is continuous. So you get a fragment of DU into your body that's emitting at over 300 millirems per hour or if you're holding the rod in your hand, it's over 300 millirems per hour. And if you got the fragment, then you got the alpha particle in there, which is an extremely hot particle, 4.15 MeV. And we're looking at what we measured over 10,000 counts per minute, 10,000 disintegrations per minute, 10,000 alpha particles per minute. In fact, in May of 2002, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs reported that over 160,000 troops that participated in Gulf War I, the period August of 1990 through the fall of 1991, basically October and November 1991, have been classified as disabled from anywhere from 10 to 100 percent. Now, my own disability didn't come about until after May of 2002. The count right now is somewhere close to 200,000. When we look at all the troops that have gone into the Persian Gulf region between August of 1990 in May of 2002, when the last formal report was written, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs formally acknowledges over 221,000 individuals are labeled as permanently disabled, and over 10,000 are deceased that had service connection disabilities. There's a big difference. There's a 60,000 increase in individuals that are disabled amongst those that served after the fall of 1991. That disability is only due to residual exposures and immunizations that were continued to be given because there was no active combat. There was no active maneuvering. So what's happened? Well, what happened prior to Gulf War I is pre-deployment health physical assessments were not given. And at the completion of Gulf War I, post-deployment health physical assessments were not given, even though we specifically requested it. In my own case, when I came back to get released after completing special projects, I said I was exposed to these. We need to do these tests. And they refused to do them. I've been a staff scientist 
at two nuclear weapons laboratories, five years at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab where the Manhattan Project started, and two years at the Lawrence Livermore Lab. Lorraine Murray is an independent scientist who specializes in radiation issues. Her degrees include BS in geology, master's degree in Near Eastern Studies, and has pursued doctoral studies in geosciences at the University of California, Davis. For the past five years, my research has focused on the damaging effects of low-level radiation. The history of depleted uranium goes back to a 1943 declassified memo known as the Groves Memorandum. In this memo, depleted uranium is recommended for development as a poison gas warfare weapon. According to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, which has declared depleted uranium illegal, approximately 17 countries have purchased depleted uranium weaponry from the United States government. In December of 1992, the director of the United States Army Environmental Policy Institute was ordered to figure out ways to reduce the toxicity of uranium munitions by Assistant Secretary of the Army Walker. In 1995, the director of AEPI told the Secretary of the Army, we can't reduce the toxicity. It's not possible. The United States Army Common Task Train states very specifically, uranium contamination will make food and water unusable. Hmm, and yet we use it in combat all over the place. That's why the United Nations Subcommission on Human Rights had ruled that uranium munitions were an illegal weapon, because they're indiscriminate. They can't be cleaned up, and they last for eternity. The amount of depleted uranium used in the first Gulf War in 1991 is approximately 340 tons, and this was admitted by the U.S. government. In Yugoslavia, Lord Robertson, who was the head of NATO in 1998, admitted in the public media that the United States had used depleted uranium warheads in every missile used in that invasion. It's estimated that at least a thousand tons of depleted uranium was used in Afghanistan in 2001 and approximately 2,400 tons were used in Iraq in 2003. The United Nations Subcommission on Human Rights, because of the fact that uranium, uranium contamination makes food and water unusable, has a permanent effect and can't be cleaned up and affects not only combatants but non-combatants. It's been ruled an illegal weapon. It was years ago. That's common sense. We all know that the United States falsely accused Iraq of possessing weapons of mass destruction in 2003. In fact, the United States invaded Iraq and used weapons of mass destruction against the Iraqis. Depleted uranium has a half-life of four and a half billion years. If we had a pound of depleted uranium now, in four and a half billion years, there would only be half a pound left. This means that the Middle East and Central Asia and Yugoslavia are contaminated forever. We're First Platoon Charlie Company and we were part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. On the battlefield, you gotta have an officer who can think on his feet. We had that. Lieutenant Walker came to us from ROTC. It didn't matter if we were in training or in combat. He was right there with us. He had confidence and dedication. And wherever he goes, we go. I'm a military brat. Uh, my father spent uh, 23, 24 years in the, in the Army. Staff Sergeant Bob Jones is a veteran of Desert Storm, a former Army Ranger now retired and disabled due to Gulf War illness. Not only is Bob ill, but his entire immediate family is affected as they all suffer from mycoplasma fermentans incognitus. During the air campaign, uh, we targeted their chemical, biological, and nuclear facilities. And so we were exposed to chemicals, biologicals, 
nuclear radiation from in the form of uh,